So welcome everyone to Psalms for Life, in which we explore a different topic, a different chapter of Safer to Hillam, the book of Psalms each week. And I want to uh, thank um, Esther Elagorovich for sponsoring this class. May she and her family uh, be blessed in the merit of sharing Psalms and Rebbe Nachman's teachings on Psalms with a, a sweet new year. May all of you be blessed with a sweet new year. Okay, so today we move on to chapter 33 of Psalms. And this Psalm is in general, a segula to strengthen your amuna. Now, it's not the um, the kind of grabbing segula like of find a shit of make a million dollars, but it's the baseline need that we all have because once we have a muna, we can function with everything else. Okay, so um, hold on one second. Now I'm going to uh, give you an overview. This parak of Tehillim is said every Shabbos morning as part of Suki to Zimra. And it's quite interesting. We know that Moshe Rabbeinu wrote Psalm 90, and some say Psalm 91 as well. It depends who you ask. But there is a Midrash that says this is actually one of 11 Psalms that Moshe Rabbeinu wrote, and this corresponds to the, uh, to the tribe of Yisachar. And he only wrote 11 because he didn't write one for Shimon because he didn't give Shimon a blessing. So um, the reason why this psalm would correspond to Yisachar in this very unique and beautiful um, uh, midrash is that Yisachar devotes themselves to Torah all day long. And therefore, they rely on Hashem to, um, they rely on Hashem for everything, okay? So they don't go out and earn a living. Now we know Zavulin, the tribe that gives money to support the scholars and the teachers in Yisachar, they, uh, they are uh, certainly given half the credit, the Torah says, even more of the credit, um, to, excuse me, I just want to uh, click on that. Okay, half the credit, even more of the credit for the mitzvah. But Yisachar is relying on Hashem, not Zivun. People think that if you're giving a paycheck, then the person you're giving a paycheck to is relying on you. And in truth, person with a muna relies on Hashem. And you are the agent of giving that paycheck and vice versa. Something important to keep in mind. Okay. So also this chapter tells us that Hashem is going to always take care of those who are righteous. Who, who are those who are righteous? Those who have a muna. Okay. Those who follow what Hashem says to do. Now, uh, Malbim says that Hashem controls the world two ways, laws of Teva, of nature, and through Hashgacha Pratis. And this is a very important theme throughout this psalm and throughout Rebbe Nachman of Breslov's teachings. So the idea is, is that if we want to rely on the laws of nature, if that's what we rely on, or if we rely on, let's say, on the Zodiac or whatever, anything that isn't Hashem, then we are governed by those laws. If we rely on Hashem, we are governed through Hashgaha Pratis, divine supervision. And Rabbi Nachman says that we should look around and see what Hashgaha from Hashem, what supervision of Hashem, what, what divine providence of Hashem we can see in our lives. And this is something to train ourselves in. It's something we are all capable of. If you have a neshama, you are capable of this. But if you don't, if you don't have the requisite training to see the world this way, you won't see it this way. So like everything else in Torah, in Judaism, 
it's not just a a reflexive response. We have to work at it. And that's what makes it so much sweeter. The amuna you earn tastes sweeter than the amuna that you just stumble into now and again. Okay. So we're going to sing, oh, we're going to say the first verse, which actually is uh which actually is singing. Rananut Sadikim Baronaila Sharam Nava Sihila. Okay. Um, sing praises. Rananu is uh, singing praises to the Lord. Um, those who are righteous for the upright praise is fitting. So what is this verse about? For those of you who just signed in, we are on um, uh, chapter 33 of Psalms. So this is referring to the song of the Zarzir, according to Perak Shira. For those of you who don't know, Perak Shira is a beautiful prayer that's composed of the songs of all of creation, the various cre created beings, whether they are the sun and the moon, animals, um, bugs, it doesn't matter. They're, they're in there. And this beautiful prayer, which by the way, I say part of it every day. I, I, it's one of my favorites. And I try to complete it each week. I do complete each week with Hashem's help. It's a, not a very long prayer. The Zarzir is two animals. It's the starling and it's the greyhound. And this is referring here to the greyhound. And what it's saying is it might look like the hunter and the hounds are going to get you, so to speak. They're the hunters. They're going to, to complete the hunt. However, we have to be joyful and righteous and rely on a Muna of Hashem because Hashem is the one who determines the outcome of the hunt. And of course, Hashem is the one who determines the outcome of everything. And the more we rely on Hashem, the less we have to fear the greyhound. In those days, in those days, greyhounds in the uh, Arabian Peninsula and the Middle East and Israel, greyhounds were hunting dogs and um, they were, they are sight hounds and they are, they're the opposite of the dogs that can sniff. They see very good distances and they run very cat fast and they catch their prey. Okay. Um, let me continue. Right. That's the, uh, so that's the simple meaning of that verse, essentially, is we rely on Hashem and we're righteous and we sing, okay? Rananu is to sing songs of praise, okay? And Rina, which is one of the types of songs, is, um, is begins, this, begins this chapter because when we sing songs of praise and we sing them with a muna, what happens is is that we are truly praising Hashem with joy. Another aspect of Rebbe Nachman's teachings that we can find throughout this song. Okay, I'm going to continue. Hodu ladonai bechinor, bechinor, benevel asor zamru lo. Okay, give thanks to Hashem with a harp and with a lyre, Okay, a lyre or a lute, a type of harp of 10 strings or 10 melodies make music to him. Okay, so there's a different translation of this. And um, hold on one second. Oh, I have a message. I'm sorry, I have to answer it. Naomi, yes, only with full names. Okay, so, um, so what, what is this agur? So again, it's also referring to Perak Shira. So this, this psalm starts off with two songs that are sung by animals in Perak Shira. So the Agur is a crane. I had to look it up, okay? And the hint here is that the crane leaps about all day and it chirps all day. It's a very noisy bird. And to confirm that, I looked for a video on the crane and it is, it hops up and down and it squawks. Okay. And it, it sings 
okay? It it sings in the service of Hashem. And this is the crane song in Perak Shira. So we have those two um, animals beginning this song. Okay, so we know if you've, if we've you've learned this um, Psalms with me before, you know how important instruments are to Psalms. King David didn't just write the words of Psalms or edit the words of Psalms, depending who wrote the Psalm. King David himself received the music for Psalms as well as the poetry as a form of prophecy. And he often directs specifically a certain kind of instrument to play each song or to accompany the words of each song. And the instruments all have very in-depth Kabbalistic meanings and so on. Um, but simply the simple meaning of this using this kinor that's mentioned in this psalm is that King David would have a kinor hanging above his bed. What is this kinor? It was a little harp that hung above his bed and that at midnight, a wind would blow, halach at midnight, okay, not just 12 o'clock on the clock, a wind would blow and the wind would blow the, the strings of the kinor, waking David HaMelech, he would wake up and he would spend the rest of the night in uh, praise of Hashem, uh, making tikkun chatzois, the morning for the temple that hadn't been built yet, let alone destroyed yet, as well as uh, receiving prophecy through which he would make his bodidus, which would turn into psalms. So in effect, the psalms are products in many ways of King David's hitbodedut that he shares with us. And he, they are his gift to us, the Jewish people, so that we can tap into the power of psalms when we make hitbodedut. How do you do that? So it's important to understand. You can take a uh, chapter of Psalms, a verse of Psalms, whatever you want, whatever moves you. And you can say them out loud at the beginning of your Hippodadut. And this can inspire you to jump into your own Hippodadut. We can also do this with other prayers, specifically with uh, Reb Nussin's prayers. It translated in English in the 50th gate, Lakute to Philos. They're beautiful prayers based on Rebbe Nachman's lessons. Um, but whatever you are using to jump into Hitbodadut with, if you feel stuck, use something. And Psalms are a great beginning if they move you, okay? Some people, somebody actually told me recently, she, she just isn't connecting to Psalms. She's saying them anyway, which we have to do, but she's not feeling that connection. Hopefully over time she will. You know, the other thing I want to mention is that when you're making it bodedut, you know, you can ask Hashem to help you learn whatever it is you're learning and you can ask him to help you apply whatever it is you need to apply. So if you need to get excited about Tehillim, ask Hashem, I, I want to feel Tehillim more. Help me get motivated. Help me find something in there that motivates me. Okay, also the kinor, this heart, <laughs> symbolizes the neshama, the soul. Why? Because we can form out of the word kinor uh, two, two phrases. One is kaf vav, which is 26. It's the Hebrew expression of the of the number 26, which of course is the gematria of Hashem's four letter name. I'm assuming most of you know that. And the other word left over is ner, and ner is a flame. And the flame of the soul is connected to Hashem at all times, okay? Which is why when we daven, when we pray, when we're immersed in prayer, we wave. Some people wave front and back, some people wave side to side. I think it's a I think it's a custom, depending whether you're Ashkenaz or Sephardic. But the point is, is that our neshama is yearning to to strengthen that connection. We have that connection, but to strengthen it. And so the kinor refers to the soul and its connection to Hashem. When I learned that, 
preparing for this, I was very moved. <laughs> I had to say that verse out loud a few times to really feel that connection. It's very lovely and beautiful. Okay. The Talmud says that the Kinor has had seven strings. In the times of Mashiach, the Talmud says it will have eight strings. Okay. And in Olam Haba, when the world has reached its complete perfection of the world to come, and we are more spiritual than material, and it's the time eternal, the Kinor will have 10 strings and it will become the instrument called the Asur, which is the second instrument mentioned in this verse. Okay. So this, this verse really, just a simple verse, has so much, there's so many more commentaries on this verse. But what we can say is it's a very um, spiritual verse, a very messianic verse. And we have to remember that the progression from seven, which is the, the um, nature including Shabbos, including Shabbat, okay, seven is the complete the completion of the material week going to eight, which is supernatural. Okay. Because it's above the seven that we live with, with Shabbat. And then all the way to 10, which we can't even fathom at this point shows also on a very straightforward level, on a very material level that the music that we're going to hear in the times of Mashiach, and then in the times of Olam Haba, that music is going to be so ethereal and gorgeous, we don't even know, we don't even, we can't even imagine, because why? You, you don't know what you don't know. You can't imagine what you don't know. Please keep that in mind. I tell myself that every day, many times each day. Okay. So um, let's continue. What time is it? Oh, we have plenty of time, I think. Okay. Shiru lo shir hadash heitivu nagen bisrua. Okay. Sing to him. Shiru lo. Sing to him. Uh, a new song. A shir hadash. And play it well. Play it beautifully um, with, uh, with a kind of... Uh, 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 ringing out a joyful shout, okay? So Rabbi Nachman teaches that we should sing to Hashem every day. What do I mean by sing, okay? I, I don't necessarily mean that you have to croak out music, although Rabbi Nachman says singing is good for you because it brings you to joy. What I mean is, is we should sing Hashem's praises every day. We should find points of connection in our own personal lives, okay, and compose songs of them to Hashem, each of us. Okay, and that may mean literal songs if you're musically inclined, or what it means on the simple level is to talk to Hashem and to create the space through your listening and talking, engaging in Hitbodadu with Hashem, that you are able to receive the thoughts from Hashem that enable you to speak beautiful words. Rabbi Nachman says that Hitbodadu is a form of prophecy, and that when we're genuinely engaged in Hitbodadu, which sometimes we feel it more than others, okay? Sometimes that sometimes is more infrequent, depends, okay? It, when we engage in honest hikbodadut, Hashem gives us the beautiful words to say that comes out of our mouths. And we'll find ourselves saying things in hikbodadut that we can't believe we said. We go so deep and they're so beautiful and our connection is so rich. If you haven't had this experience, don't worry about it. Keep going. You will have this experience. Okay, just take the time to really open your heart to Hashem. If you have had this experience, then you understand what that experience feels like. And you want more of it. It's it's addictive in a way. It's, it's wonderfully addictive. Okay, so singing songs to Hashem is really what each of us, is capable of doing, and each of us has to train ourselves to do. So if you 
get through your heat boat of dude each day. Hopefully you're, you're doing it for a certain amount of time each day. And you find yourself uh, that you didn't, you didn't feel that connection. You didn't sing that songs of praise. Look out your window, go for a walk, look at your child, look at the dinner you're making, look and find something to praise in what you're doing and speak of it out loud to Hashem. Okay, not just a request, not just Hashem, I'm making dinner, let my dinner turn out well, I have company coming. But Hashem, Hashem, I am, I am so grateful that I have the food I need to make dinner. And, and I'm so grateful that I know what I'm doing and I have a recipe. I'm so grateful that I have the tools I need and so on. Hashem, you're so good to me. I have everything I need right here. Okay. And little by little, your own song to Hashem will come out. Now, I chose a very mundane thing on purpose. I could have said, you know, look at the heavens and sing about the heavens. You can do that too, of course. But most of us are looking down all day long. But we can lift ourselves up even when we're looking down. Meaning, even when you're hunched over, do, working on your computer, fixing something, cooking something, cleaning something, typing something. Make a song to Hashem. Take a one minute break. You know, when we're sitting at the computer, we're told every hour you should get up for five minutes and stretch and take a break. I don't know anybody who actually does that, but the idea is right. Okay. So if you don't do that, okay, all right, fair enough. But what we can do is we can take a break to thank Hashem, to praise Hashem one minute out of every hour of the day. One minute. Could you imagine? That's 24 minutes a day, or you'll be asleep for, let's say, seven hours of that. So that's 17 hours a day of praising Hashem. Incredible. Okay. I mean, 17 minutes, excuse me, 17 minutes a day of praising Hashem. 17 is tov. You want to increase to 18 minutes, even better. You've got high. Okay. Take that. Take the advice of King David. Okay. Um. Let me see. Um, I really want to do verse four, but I'm going to skip it for now because it's rather lengthy. If we have time, we'll get back to it. I think we'll do hey, and then I want to do a few verses at the end. Oh, I don't know how we're going to get to all this. Okay. Um, so let's go to hey, let's go to five. Oh, have tzedakah mishpat. Chesed Adonai Malaah Haaretz. Okay, so this verse is he loves Hashem loves tzedakah and mishpat. He loves charity and justice, and the earth is full of what? It's full of his chesed. Okay, it's full of his loving kindness. Okay. So there are three key words in this verse. The first is tzedakah, the next is mishpat, and the third is chesed. Why is this relevant particularly now? This is very relevant to this time of year. This is the time of year where we are engaged in, we will be engaged certainly in Rosh Hashanah, in mishpat, in justice, and in judgment. Okay, it's a time of judgment that we're preparing for. How do we prepare for it? With tzedakah and chesed. Tzedakah is a kind of limited form of mercy because it is part of justice and what is fair. Tzedakah literally means righteousness and justice. I'm sure most of you know. And tzedakah, when we give charity, we are giving only what is fair. We are distributing 10%, 20% of whatever Hashem gives us, okay? And the, um, excuse me, sorry, I got distracted. And the, uh, the chesed is just pure mercy, Hashem's pure kindness. So we should err, especially on this time of year, on the side of chesed, Okay. Because if you look at the construct of this verse, and by the way, it's not just this time of year, but it says that Hashem loves tzedakah and mishpat, ohev tzedakah and mishpat, right? But the kindness, the loving kindness of Hashem fills the earth. 
So that is a richer description of that attribute. And that is what chesed is. And each of us, especially again, especially this time of year, we need to pick up the tzedakah that we're giving and give it with chesed, give it with loving kindness. We should always give it with loving kindness. We should always feel good that we are giving this money. We are doing Hashem's mitzvah and we are doing a good deed. We should feel happy to give and, and really grateful that we're able to give. But this time of year, we should give even more with even more love in our hearts. Okay, because why? Because teshuva, tefillah, and tzedakah, uh, uh, repentance and, and prayer and tzedakah, they destroy, they sweeten a harsh decree. Okay, and we all want a sweet decree for the coming year. Okay, um, Rebbe Nachman says something really amazing. Okay. He says that we should shower mercy and chesed on even those who have harmed us. Okay, and I really wanted to mention this, especially again this time of year, because we are working right now on forgiving anybody whoever did us any harm. We have to forgive people every day before we go to bed at night. We say the prayer in the sitter that says, I forgive everybody. I don't want anybody, God forbid, should be punished on my account. But even more than that, what we have to do, says Rebbe Nachman, is we have to actually be extra kind to those who have harmed us. We have to go out of our way to show them mercy and compassion, okay? I've explained before that there are very deep um, spiritual exchanges going on when we do this. But on the simple level, it means that we are looking at a human being who is flawed. And it reminds us we ourselves are flawed. We've put our own foot in our own mouth many times. We've said things we didn't mean. How can we not extend that to the other person? Then what are we doing? We are emulating Hashem. And that is what the, um, the underpinnings of revealing Hashem's glory in this world are. And that's our main mission is to reveal his kavod in this world. And that is to emulate Hashem, to imitate Hashem, to say, Hashem, look at Hashem's attributes. Okay, he loves tzedakah. And he also loves justice and fairness. But what does he fill the earth with? Loving kindness. And when we emulate Hashem, it, it does sweeten our relationships with everybody and especially Hashem. Okay. Um, we are going to skip um, a little bit. Ahead. Do we have time? Yes, we have a little bit of time. Um, I, I really don't know why I can't get through all of this. I guess it's... Um, Okay. Okay, so let's go to verse 17, Yud Zion. Sheker Hasus Lishua Uvarov Chelo Lo Yimalet. Okay. A horse is uh, false. It's not, it's a false hope for victory. And with his power, he won't escape. So, this verse is telling us to not rely on our horse. What is our horse? I don't know. Maybe you own a horse. A horse might be an SUV. A horse might be your house. A horse might be something else in your life. But Reb Nussin explains this, that the horse is the false assurances we get if we rely on money or our money. Okay. And that he says that we give ourselves a false assurance that if we only had more money, everything would be okay. All right. And he says that the horse, why a horse? Why are we relying on a horse? Why does that have, what does that have to do with money? Because it represents the traveling we do to go get money. What does that mean? The traveling we do to get money. So, it means that, let's say you're in business. Okay, you go, I'm sorry, let me just, um, let me 
just see what this, somebody chatted, somebody typed something in. Okay. So what does this mean? It means that you're traveling to go get money. You're in business. You have to do this. You have to do that. Okay. That's one simple interpretation. The other kind of way to look at this is the travel traveling we do with our flawed imagination that Rebbe Nachman often speaks of. And that's the traveling and the fantasies of our mind. I don't know that there's a human being who hasn't at least once fantasized about winning the lottery or being rich or whatever, whatever, whatever. Or if only I did this job or that job and I got all that money and then everything would be okay because I would, oh, I would give a lot of tzedakah. Yeah, that would be my goal. But then I'd also do this and I'd also do that and I'd also do that. Is there anything wrong with money per se? No. Is there anything wrong with rather being comfortably off than being poor? No, of course not. But when a person gets caught up in the negative imagination of constantly indulging in this fantasy, okay, and this idea of, um, this idea of uh, forgetting about everything else, one is traveling in one's mind and one is really focused on something that excludes Hashem. Now, again, yes, you want to give tzedakah with the money and all this, but that has to be your main focus. But to sit and think about it, Reb Nussin says it's not necessarily the best way to spend your brain power. Okay. Um, look. We're all human. I, I can think of all the times I sat and thought about recipes I was going to make in menus or, oh, what would I do if I had the money to pay for this? Of course, we're all human. But what do we put at the forefront of our thoughts? And we need to think about what we're thinking. And when we read this verse, it's a very, very pull out your safer to hell and get out your Psalm 33. Read the whole Psalm. I want to go over every verse so bad, but we don't have so much time. It would take me two hours. It's it, every line. Okay. In this verse leads up to uh, this idea of think about Hashem, have a moon in Hashem. Don't have Amuna and other things. Strengthen your Amuna and you're going to be okay because you'll be connected to Hashem. So the Reb, uh, the Reb Nelson also says to us that the Zohar Kodesh says the horse must serve the rider. And this, you probably have heard this before. I know the Balhatanya mentions this and it's mentioned in other places, but the source is the Zohar. And the idea is, is to, is to take a hold of your thoughts and not let them take you on a ride. You rein them in. This concept is very foreign for a lot of people. If you ask the average person, when, when I'm doing coaching, one of the first things I ask somebody is, where do your thoughts come from? And most people say, I don't know, they just have my thoughts. They just pop into my head. But the idea is, is to begin to reflect on your thoughts. Think about your thoughts. If you're listening to this right now, you're watching this, think about your thoughts and think about how you can mold and shape your thoughts. The first time you accomplish this consciously, you're having a negative thought and you replace it with a positive thought. The, whatever that negative thought may be or positive thought may be, it, it, Depends. The first time you do this, you will feel this incredible sense of accomplishment. It is like jumping off the high dive. It is something truly amazing. It's like riding a bike for the first time. And you say, oh, I can control my thoughts. And if I can control my thoughts, I can manage. Okay. I'm not saying control 100%, but I can manage my feelings and emotions. They're all linked. They all work together. Okay. A thought comes before a feeling or emotion. It comes very, very fast, very quickly. Okay, so we don't realize it, but a positive thought leads to a positive feeling or emotion and a negative thought needs to, leads to the opposite. And if we begin with our thoughts 
and we realize that they're just the horse. Okay, that's all they are. The thoughts are the horse. They might be, you know, negative desires. They might be negative thoughts about people. They might be these fantasies about money, whatever it is. It doesn't have to be necessarily one thing. And we can replace them. You're free. You have freed yourself. I know from my own experience over many years of working on this, I'm certainly flawed. I am not perfect, but I know, I, I know how wonderful it is to be able to say, don't go there in my thoughts. I'm not going there. My thoughts want to yank me over in that direction, but I'm going to pull them back in this direction. Okay. All right. There's just so much more in this beautiful psalm that we'll have to get to. Maybe we'll do a whole other round of psalms with all the things I didn't talk about sometime. Um, and uh, God willing, next week we'll do Psalm 34. Please don't go. I am going to um, uh, stop the recording now so that we can say to Hillam together. And if you're available, please stay and join us. Okay, hold on one second. And uh, let's see.